to what degree it depends a lot of women will experience can't fall asleep can't stay asleep when they used to sleep pretty well so many of my patients they want to lose weight and when i'm telling them they need to slow down and they need to eat more they're yeah. like what yeah this is yeah. the opposite of what i need to do it's considered very sexy and so everyone's like I'm going to intermittent fast or fast and, and do all these things to preserve my mitochondria. And I'm like, except I'm going to use your phrase. You're burning the candle at both ends. Friends, I have a, a fabulous show for you today. I am so passionate about hormones, in particular, perimenopause and menopause, as I am perimenopausal myself. So many of my patients that come to see me for the first time tell me they feel lost frustrated that when they've tried to speak to their previous provider, they were overlooked, disregarded, especially with regards to perimenopause and menopause. Why is it that this phase of life is really not talked about? Growing up, I don't think I ever even heard the word perimenopause. And when I've overheard anyone talking about menopause, it was always a hush-hush scenario. For those of us born with female parts, we're led to believe it's natural for us to feel crazy, tired, to gain weight, that there's a foreigner living inside of our bodies. I know several years ago, that is how I felt before I really understood what was happening inside of my body and dove deeper. Today, I have a very special guest, Dr. Carrie Jones. Dr. Jones is board certified in naturopathic endocrinology with a master's degree in public health. She has taught courses in gynecology and advanced endocrinology, is a former adjunct faculty for the National University of Natural Medicine. Dr. Jones was the medical director for Precision Analytical, the creators of the Dutch test for nearly a decade. Currently, she is the head of medical education at Rupa Health. I am guessing you have likely heard of Dr. Jones. Her Instagram is packed with such fun information. She really has a knack for explaining complex things like female hormones. If you're a podcast lover, you likely have heard Dr. Jones speak as she is a sought after guest due to her incredible wealth of knowledge. She also has a podcast of her own. She is very passionate about the root cause medicine, where she really dives into important topics to uncover the root cause, symptoms, and also treatments for different medical conditions. Dr. Jones, it is such an honor. Welcome to the show. Oh my goodness. It's such a pleasure on my half. I really appreciate being on today and being able to talk with you. We are very interested, Dr. Jones, in learning from you about female hormones. I am very excited to dive deep into perimenopause and menopause, as this can be a very difficult time in our lives to say the least, no. <laughs> and also get into the nitty gritty of hormone testing and some basic management strategies. But first, most of us have a story, a reason for what drives us, perpetuates the long hours, dedication, school, training. We really want to know, Dr. Jones, what is your story? The why behind the pathway you embarked on, was there something that propelled you, flamed the passion you obviously have with regards to hormones? Yes. So I have known since I was, I guess, a little girl that I wanted to be a doctor. And I grew up predominantly in Lexington, Kentucky. So I grew up in the South. And my hormone or health class, I guess, sex ed, whatever you want to call it, was taught by the male football coach. So you can imagine how a health class went talking taught by the you know by the football coach and it only got worse from there and so when i got into medical school when i found naturopathic medicine i just continued to stick with women's health and hormones because i realized myself my friends 
Um, and eventually my patients literally had no idea about themselves. They, they didn't really understand their cycle. They didn't really understand what a hormone was. They didn't, they could, they would get pregnant, weren't really sure how it happened. They would go through menopause, weren't really sure what that was about. And so it became an absolute passion of mine to understand hormones first selfishly, because I knew I was going to go through all these changes and have all these questions too. And second, because I had all these, you know, again, friends, colleagues, family, patients who had the same concerns, the same questions, the same confusion. And um, that is what has propelled it forward. So my real passion in life is really to empower women and to educate them on what the heck is happening in their body. What are the ovaries doing? What happens if you have had your ovaries removed? What happens when you're young and trying to get pregnant or experiencing PMS or as you get into perimenopause and menopause? Because just isn't explained well. We don't really get a manual about any of this stuff, and that'd be really helpful. So that's what I'm. That's what I'm here for. Oh my goodness, I I love that. <laughs> I'm a women's health specialist. I am all about empowering women. I absolutely love that. Let's start with perimenopause. Mm. This is a term many may have not heard of, or possibly they've heard the term, but they really are not familiar with what is happening at this time. Can you speak a little bit about what perimenopause is, what it means, and when this typically occurs? I liken it to reverse puberty. So it's the time of our lives, usually, usually once we get into our 40s and early 50s, where we back out of being a cycling woman. So we all remember puberty or we remember the kind of chaos and hormonal changes and we get in our period for the first time and you know going bra shopping and all the things and then we, that turns us into you know we're cycling we get our period we're a cycling woman reproductive age and it continues for a couple decades and then we reverse out of it. Now unfortunately whoever designed perimenopause didn't like think it through all the way and for a lot of us going through that that reversing is rough. So we will hit our 40s or early 50s and we suddenly don't sleep like we used to. We're like, ah, I used to sleep so well and now I'm not sleeping like I used to. Or you're getting some weight gain and nothing's changed. You haven't changed your exercise, you haven't changed your diet, you haven't changed anything. And you're like, I'm, I'm, I'm getting more apple shape. What's this about? You're feeling warmer. You're like, fanning yourself, you're taking your sweater or sweatshirt off, you're putting it back on, you're taking it off again, your moods are kind of shifting, right? Like all these shifts that you're like, I literally haven't changed anything other than had a birthday. What is going on? And so in perimenopause, because it is the reversing out of our reproductive age into menopause, which is where we don't get a period at all, our ovaries essentially shut down, there is some time of chaos for a lot of people where our hormones are up and down, where there's some miscommunication in the hormones, where there's a lot of shifting, where there didn't have to be shifting, you know, in our younger years. And that essentially is perimenopause. So I'm making it sound scary. I have a lot of women that are like, holy crap, is this going to happen to me? Like, oh, there's, there's a lot of good that goes with it. And there's a lot that we can do while going or to prepare ourselves going into perimenopause. But ultimately, I want women to know that they're not alone. And if they're in it right now and they're like, that's me, that's me, I have all of those, those symptoms, am I crazy? No, you're not crazy. You might feel crazy because the hormones are going up and down, but you are absolutely not crazy. This is, a, this is a biological thing that happens as we start to get older, for better or worse. Well, you basically described me to a T. <laughs> <laughs> And so many of the patients, wonderful women that I work with. Mm -hmm. This uh, perimenopause phase, do all women have the same symptoms? Does this phase last for roughly the same time for everyone? That's the problem. When I talk about, I wish perimenopause, whoever designed it, I wish that they would have thought it through a little bit better. Um, no, yeah. it's very different for everyone. <laughs> there are common themes and generalities you know, um, a lot of women who go through perimenopause experience hot flashes and night sweats. To what degree? It depends. A lot of women will experience can't fall asleep, can't stay asleep when they used to sleep pretty well. And it may come and go, and it's to different, you know, levels. 
Um, a lot of women will experience brain fog. You know, they're like, I used to be so good. I used to be able to multitask. And now I find I have to keep lists and I'm just not as, as uh, sharp as I feel like I was in my 20s and 30s. But again, it's to various degrees. And then the amount of time is definitely very different, unfortunately. Some women sail through perimenopause very quickly. Some women, it la like, for example, my mom, started putting the air conditioning on very low. And I remember it being, I mean, to this day, we joke when I go home, you know, we call it subarctic. My dad will text me when I'm, my parents live in the South still in Atlanta. And my dad will text me, remember to bring a jacket, <laughs> remember to bring a sweatshirt. <laughs> Your mom still has it in the fifties. Your mom still needs it super um, cold. And I've told this story before and a lot, a lot, a lot of women resonate with that. I have a lot of women of, of all ages as they got through menopause that are like, me too, me too. I'm in my 60s or my 70s or even 80s. And I still need it to be, you know, really cool in the house. So I need a fan because I just feel like I can't temperature regulate. Whereas other women are like, oh yeah, I had that for a few years and then and then it and then it was done. It was over. I managed it pretty well. So it is quite variable, which is why you can't look at somebody next to you, your best friend, your office mate, your neighbor, and go, oh, so not fair. You know, like I'm having all these symptoms and they're not, or it doesn't seem as severe. What's wrong with me? There's a lot you can do, first of all, but second of all, it's not the same. It's, it's not samesies, unfortunately, or fortunately, I depending. I too would like a word with whoever right. came up with this. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes. Yes. Um, I'm wondering, Dr. Jones, uh, can you speak a little bit about lifestyle factors that may play a role in how well we transition? I see the big ones, and I would love to see if you would agree with me um, with your patients as well. So big ones are, is we are heading into perimenopause. We're generally in our 40s. So in our 40s, big changes in our life are happening. So if you are in the workforce, usually you are at the, t the peak, the pinnacle, you're responsible for a lot in the workforce. And or if you have children, it, your children may be graduating high school, entering college, or depending when you had children, they're graduating from college. So big changes there. Or if you had children later in life, you're going into perimenopause when your children are going into puberty. So again, lots of changes, lots of stresses. Your parents are getting older. Your spouse's parents are getting older. So now you have become the caretaker in some regard to your somebody's parents because they're getting older and they're needing more help. This is the time when we've got divorce, we have death, we have taxes, we have financial issues, et cetera, et cetera, right? Things that were carefree in our 20s compound by the time we hit our 40s. So how we handle stress, because we can't get rid of it, how we handle how we're coping our stress, stress management mechanisms, um, I see are a big one. I find my women who have the wor worst perimenopause are tell me quote nothing has changed but yet everything has changed in their external life the other big thing i see are sleep dysregulation so they kind of skated into perimenopause not having great sleep to begin with um they were on their phone late at night uh they were you know didn't sleep really well but they could manage with a couple cups of coffee they were fine once they hit perimenopause you, you can't get away with the things you could skate through in your 20s and 30s, and that includes dietary choices as well. So if your blood sugar is kind of all over the place, if you are just trying to sustain on a smoothie and a salad with a little bit of chicken and four cups of coffee, like that is just not going to fly when you hit perimenopause, no. right? Like at all. <laughs> or, or if you are a heavy, heavy exerciser, this is the other one. You're like, I exercise six times a week. I am, you know, I am on my Peloton bike. I hit CrossFit. I'm at the gym. I'm, I'm, I'm a, I run five miles every day. Like I'm, I'm, I'm that unfortunately keeps, it will catch up with you when you hit perimenopause. And it is the worst thing. I feel, I completely understand when I would have to tell my perimenopausal patients, I need you to dial it back. Like I need you to truly stop, slow down, rest, relax, <laughs> like stop running five miles a day. Stop doing the Peloton bike twice a day. It, you're just adding to the cortisol, which is stress, and you're just making things worse and you're, everything is shifting. So it's not fair and it's not fun. And, you know, women get super mad and they should, they sh rightfully should. Um, but these are these sort of outside things that I see, thankfully, that we can work to manage. Now, other things that can be more challenging are the chemicals in our environment. So 
sometimes we just can't control that. If you live in an area that's heavily sprayed, if you are in a, in a, a career or you have a hobby that's around a lot of chemicals, um, if your neighbor is constantly putting pesticides and herbicides on their garden, like I understand that can be really hard to avoid, but those chemicals really are kind of wreaking havoc on our liver, um, on our skin, on our cells, on our mitochondria, on our brain. So the, the more you can do to read labels, look at what you've got in your house. Do you have a house full of scented candles and plugins? Um, are you using very scented personal body care lotions and creams and detergents and body washes and hairsprays and things like that? It's shocking when people start to cut it out or choose a healthier method. They'll say, oh my gosh, Carrie, I had no idea. I had no idea the impact. I was wearing perfume every single day and I stopped wearing it and would, lo and behold, my skin is clearing up, my headaches are better, my mid-afternoon crash is gone just from not wearing conventional perfume that has the phthalates in it as the artificial fragrance. And I hear this a lot, so I make sure I mention it because I have real world experience of women going, I don't wanna give up my candles, but I gave up my candles and I, you know, I feel better. I'm like, I know. Science That's me. Fair. That was me. <laughs> I didn't say it was fair. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, it was. I'm 48, so years ago, I know probably about five years ago, I was had these terrible headaches. Mm -hmm. I've had headaches probably most of my life, but they were getting worse. And I'm sitting at my desk with the candles glowing, <laughs> thinking, <laughs> "Why does my head hurt so bad?" Mm -hmm. And <laughs> fast forward to now. This is a conversation I have every single day, yeah. every day. What are you using? I send them to the environmental working yes. group website, tell them to scan their products. I changed everything about my products. And, you know, I tell them they don't have to go change everything all at once, mm -hmm. but getting those toxic dryer sheets out of their lives would be a great start. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I love also that you mentioned cortisol. Mm -hmm. This is something that I see regularly that I was doing the same thing. I was doing HIIT workouts almost every day, running every day and taxing my body way past the point that it was wanting to go. Mm -hmm. And can you Speak a little bit about why we need to consider our adrenal glands during perimenopause. I know that for many of us, as you mentioned, we're busy with our jobs, our families, possibly burning the candle at both ends like I was. Mm -hmm. Are there things we should be considering with regards to calorie restriction maybe or intermittent fasting, sleep, things that we should really change at this phase in our life. Yes, 100%, absolutely. And again, women hate to hear this because they've <laughs> been doing it or they've read on social media. If you are a, you know, an anti-ager, if you are a biohacker, like this is this is what the elite elite athletic athletes do. Usually they're men, not always, but usually. So you should do it too. It's what could promote gets promoted at your gym. It's considered very sexy and so everyone's like I'm gonna intermittent fast or fast and, and do all these things to preserve my mitochondria. And I'm like, except, I'm gonna use your phrase, you're burning the candle at both ends. You, yeah. you have no wick left <laughs> to do this. The biohacking is not working at the moment. And so I like intermittent fasting if you have the reserves to do it, but I don't like it every day. In fact, the two big experts in the female world are Dr. Mindy Pels and Cynthia Thurlow, who is a nurse practitioner. They're both very good friends of mine. They have amazing books on it. And even, and they're both menopausal. And even they're like, no, women, we have to do it differently. Don't follow the men. Don't follow the built physique trainer that's online talking about anti-aging and the mitochondria because they don't cycle or they're not transitioning into no cycle because they're perimenopausal. We have to do it differently because of the hormone levels that we have. Now, when it comes to intermittent fasting, some people, freak out on me and go, well, you're just promoting a, like a uh, abnormal diet culture or calorie restriction. I said, oh, intermittent fasting and calorie restriction are different. Intermittent fasting is where you take your normal eating plan, or however that is, and you squish it into a certain number of hours, eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours, as opposed to eating from the minute you wake up to the minute you go to bed. Calorie restriction is actually restricting the calories. 
So when we get into perimenopause, one of the first things we do if we start to gain weight, which is very unfortunately common, a side effect of perimenopause, is to get more of that abdominal fat, um, that visceral fat, which we don't want around our organs. And there's a few reasons for that between hormone changes and blood sugar and cortisol. But women, what do we do? We, we, we immediately restrict calories. And when we restrict calories, oftentimes we restrict protein. And in fact, uh, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, who is another really wonderful um, doctor in our space who is all about women's health, feels that us women are not necessarily, um, we're under-muscled is what she says. She said, we don't have enough muscle on our body. And then we cut protein, which is the, is the big thing we need. And or maybe we're not eating enough protein to begin with. We have some egg whites for breakfast, or we have a little smoothie, um, and then a little salad for lunch with some chicken on it, and then maybe a dinner or a protein bar. And she's like, no, we need to eat protein. You need to, the 30 grams of protein. And I was like, man, 30 grams of protein is like a lot of protein. And I'm in my, I'm, I'll be 46 in June. And so I, a couple years ago, following uh, Dr. Lyon, I started adding in boatloads more protein, real protein into my diet, um, not just relying on protein bars and whatnot. And man, I felt so much better. <laughs> everything just did better. My skin, my hair, just my muscles, everything. I was like, okay, noted. But it's usually something we cut as we get older. Oh my gosh, you know, my jeans are a little tighter. I don't know what's happening. I'm just going to go ahead and cut, you know, there's a lot of calories and protein. So I'm going to, I'm going to cut this out when in fact, protein is the one thing that we need. And then I do want to just further with calorie restriction. Um, if you're already low calorie and then you're the chronic exerciser, those are just two compounding stresses on your body. And so you actually probably need more calories in the protein department, but do consider instead of six days a week of HIT or Peloton or running, but really either ease back, only do it three days a week, or bring in more of the gentle things, walking. And I don't mean speed walking, because you're, you're, but I mean like <laughs> walking to relax, walking to enjoy the night, walking. I walk, I have a dog, so we don't have a choice. We walk all the time. But I love to look and see what my neighbors are doing because a lot of my neighbors decorate for every holiday. So I'm like, so I'm always <laughs> walking, checking That's out awesome. their front porches. <laughs> yeah. What flags do you have up? What, should, what decorations do you have going on? Exactly. So it's it's having those, are the type A people who are listening, realizing that you're, we're going to have to let go with some control and we're going to have to focus a little bit on the relaxing, slower movements, slower yoga, Pilates, or more rest days. And I know it seems counterintuitive and they hate me, but sure enough, I'm usually right. You're usually I, right. <laughs> I, I can appreciate that because so many, so many of my patients, they want to lose weight. And when I'm telling them they need to slow down and they need to eat more, they're like, what? Yeah. This is yeah. the opposite of what I need to do. And then we do their testing and I'm like, look, see, yeah. <laughs> your blood sugar is, is a mess. Like yeah. your cortisol is a mess. We need to get this in line or you're not going to lose weight. Right. And I have this thing where I say weight loss should be a side effect instead of a goal. Mm. Because if that's the goal, it's very difficult to attain that goal because then you, you don't really have a great way to measure the way you're doing it, except if you're saying, I'm going to cut 500 calories. How else are you supposed to know if you're on the right track with it, right. aside from what's on the scale? Right, right, so, right. And cortisol, people forget when we talk about cortisol, everyone's like, oh, that's the stress hormone. I understand cortisol. But cortisol's number one job in the body actually is to increase your, your glucose, your blood sugar. So cortisol is what we call a glucocorticosteroid, meaning gluco because glucose is its number one job, cortico because that's the location it's at in the adrenal glands, and steroid because it's a steroid hormone. And so when you skip meals or are very stressed out and you have a lot of cortisol or you don't have any glucose because you've been skipping meals or you're in meetings or running the kids around or whatever it is, long intermittent fasting, then you're going to increase your cortisol, which is a normal physiologic response. It's trying to help you. And that is going to release more glucose into your bloodstream because the, the body's like, well, something's wrong. You don't have enough glucose. You're stressed out. There's a tiger in front of you clearly. 
So I'm going to dump a bunch of glucose to get to your brain so that you can think clearly and fight or run away from this tiger that's in front of you. But we all know it's not really a tiger. It's, you know, pickup line at school. It's, it's the <laughs> amount of emails you've got going in at your, you know, your Slack messages that are blowing up. It's the fight you just had with your spouse. It's, you know, it's all the things that add up in a day. It's not actually usually a threatening situation like a tiger in front of you, but our body doesn't know that. So our glucose keeps getting erratic because the cortisol is spiking. Like I got to protect you. I got to protect you. I got to protect you. And by, and then hitting perimenopause where we already lose out on great blood sugar or insulin um, rhythms usage just by, unfortunately the loss of some of our hormones means we don't do glucose or insulin very well anymore. It just adds to why am I gaining weight? Why do I feel erratic? What's going on with my mood? What's going on with my brain fog? And that blood sugar plays a big role in that. You have such a knack for explaining things. <laughs> Friends, you definitely need to follow Carrie on Instagram. She has the best posts, informative, but with humor. Yes. <laughs> I'll link it in the show notes. Um, let's touch on menopause briefly. Yeah. I've had so many patients tell me they're dreading the change. I'm using air quotes over here for those just listening to the audio. In this phase of life, is, it, is this really something to dread? Wow. Do all of us experience horrific menopausal symptoms? Are we all just destined to gain weight and forget where our keys are? <laughs> <laughs> no, and we need to remember, science is just starting to talk about this more, thank goodness. We spend a third, if not a half, of our life in menopause, depending how long we're gonna live. A third, if not half of our life in menopause. And it's just the next transition for us. It is a great upgrade to like our next, you know, we had like our first, our first area, which was kind of like leading into puberty up until about 20, right? So we had our like young, dumb, figure it out type of years. And then we get what we call our reproductive years, which whether you want kids or not, I, I really, you know, I don't care. Uh, but it's those years where now we're like consistent, we should be consistently cycling and we know what's going on. We're trying to figure out our hormones and we're in, we're in the go get them stage. And, and if we want to grow a family stage and, and, and maybe career stage, and then we get into menopause and we just continue to shine even more. So in menopause, you lose your period. So the reproductive part is over, but oh my gosh, you've got all of this like wealth of knowledge and experience. And for a lot of women, they, they feel like they can finally be who they want to be, or they have the confidence and the experience to, you know, set boundaries when they need to, and to go after what they want to, um, to pick up new hobbies, to travel, M things maybe they didn't do when they were younger. They're now like, you know what? I'm 55. I'm going to do it now. And I would see this in my patients where they would fear menopause and get in it and then be like, this is awesome. I'm like this whole new woman. I'm like, you literally are. Yes, <laughs> yes, it is good for you. And again, if we as a human race got told about the stages women go through in life, we would be better equipped to handle menopause and we wouldn't fear it at all. If we knew heading into our forties, like things we should probably start tweaking around diet, lifestyle, chemicals, stress, or what's considered normal. Do you know the amount of relationships that have broken up because of hormonal changes or put them in therapy probably for good reasons, but I had a lot, I predominantly saw women when I saw patients and, you know, they'd hit their forties and they would be like, I hate you. I hate me. I hate them. <laughs> I hate my kids. You know, like what is happening with my mood? I'm anxious. I'm depressed. I'm angry. And I'm like, oh, you're right to be so, but also it's your hormones. <laughs> so <laughs> let's get you into some therapy and let's work on your hormones at the same time. And the more women I saw, the more that I heard that over and over and over again. And so if we just had education from the get-go, from the young years. And I understand maybe when we were 13, 14, 20, we didn't want to hear about menopause. That was weird and awkward and, you know, years away from us. But if we, at least in the back of our head, had heard it, and so by the time we hit our 30s and 40s, we were like, oh yeah, what was that thing we learned? Oh yeah, okay, I, I know it's coming. Like, oh, a hot flash? Oh, that's, okay, that's what they talk about. All right, now I know I need to seek out education, seek help, etc. So no, I don't, I don't think women should dread menopause at all. And I can understand if they're looking at their moms or their aunties or their older sisters or their grandmothers and they had it really rough. 
It doesn't mean you are too. It doesn't mean it at all. It's menopause. Your age of menopause may be kind of like genetically influenced, but how you go through it is predominantly, I feel, the outside factors that we can clean up, shine up, improve. I, I love that. I feel like it's one of my missions in life to help women of all ages, yeah. but particularly with perimenopause and then menopause. And I usually say, well, when we get to menopause, we're not going to have those same fluctuations yeah. because it's the times of fluctuation when we have those symptoms. And that can be really hard mm -hmm. for somebody to understand because, you know, they're, they may get their blood level checked from a previous provider. This happens a lot. I yeah. see this a lot. And they're told, you know, they don't have any estrogen. It's, it's, it's completely gone and their progesterone is really low. And I, I'm asking them, was there, what day of your cycle did yeah. you even have it tested? And they have no idea. And so I, I tell them that there's lots of different nuances mm -hmm. with this. And I definitely feel, as soon as I have a woman, I walk into the room, I see on her paper, she wrote down crazy periods. I look at her age and I'm like, yep, yep. we're gonna have a talk today. <laughs> <laughs> yes, or when they ask you, I don't understand. I used to have 28 day cycles and now I skipped last month and had two this month. And I'm like, well, how old are you? I'm 47. I'm like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, okay. Let's, yes. let's, I'm not saying it's fair or fun, but it's common and here's why, and here's what we're going to do about it. Yes. Or I hear, I, I'm so much more emotional these days. Yes. I can't, I cry at the silliest thing mm -hmm. and you know, I'm just, I'm smiling as they're talking and they're looking at me like, why is she smiling <laughs> right. at me? But then by the end of our conversation, they're like, you understand. I'm like, you yeah. damn right. I do. Mm -hmm. I'm one of them. I'm yeah. one of us. <laughs> yes. Know? Yes, I do understand. And if the whole family knew everybody what was going on, oh my goodness, it would make the transition so much well, my easier. My husband knows. My husband knows. knows too. You better believe it. And in fact, I think it, I mean I've been in I've been I've been in hormones. Uh, let's see, I've been in the naturopathic field twenty four years. I've been in a doctor seventeen. So my hormones, my husband's known a long time. And I was telling him, I think this is probably five or six years ago about hormonal changes. So I must have just been about forty. And he was just wide-eyed. He's like, that's what happens? He's like, did that happen to my mom? I'm like, yeah, we've talked about it. Your mom and I have talked about it. Like, th this is what can happen. I'm just warning you that I clearly am in the field. I'm going to do the best that I can. And I have a lot of resources, thank goodness. But this is what can happen to women. So buckle up, yeah. buttercup, because I'm not Absolutely. special. Like a lot of us, 50% of the population is going to go through this. <laughs> yeah. And I tell my husband, don't even think about touching the thermostat. Yeah, <laughs> it's my domain I can, now. <laughs> I control the thermostat now, forever. <laughs> we in, we'll be in our our main bedroom. The, our bedroom is can be really warm at night, and so in the morning, I'll look at my husband and I'll go, "How did you sleep? Were you hot last night?" And he'll be like, "God, it was so hot in here." I'm like, "Okay, thank God. Not yet, not yet. Okay, he's hot too, and I'm hot. So this is a bedroom thing, not a Carrie's hormones thing." So I, I'm always like, were you hot last night? So I have this like check-in. Is it me? Am I crazy? <laughs> nope. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Now that we have the basics down, I really want to get your thoughts on hormone testing. Yeah. I mentioned women coming to me and they had their blood levels checked mm -hmm. and it was just a random day. Can you speak into hormone testing timing Yeah. and the importance of cycle day? when we're having our hormones tested. Yeah, and it's important to know that we have a lot of hormones. I believe the CDC says the last count, like we have over 50 hormones in our body from the brain down to all, you know, thyroid to insulin, to estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, cortisol, et cetera. And so when you ask a provider, I'd like my hormones checked, they're generally going to think, oh, you want your estrogen and progesterone checked, like your ovarian, sort of what, you know, your women's hormones checked. But really, as we get into perimenopause, because all our hormones shift somewhat, it's important to really be thorough and look at a lot of your hormones. How is your thyroid doing? It is common for your thyroid to shift. What's going on with your glucose and insulin fasting? That, that 
can unfortunately get worse as we get into perimenopause. And so some of these things is, is nice to know, even if you're like, I had that tested like five years ago. Yeah, but five years ago you were in your 30s and now you're in your 40s. We need to, we need to do that again. So then it's also important to know that our, a lot of our hormones work on a rhythm, right? There, we, we have a cycle in theory every month. And so our hormones follow a very controlled roller coaster up, down, up, down throughout the cycle. When you have a normal expected cycle, then you want to check your hormones about five to seven days after you ovulate or release an egg. So let's pretend you're a 28 day girl. Let's pretend you ovulate in the middle, day 14-ish. So you're gonna check your hormones day 19, 20, 21. There's a little bit of a window there. So that section of your cycle is called the luteal phase. It's the, it's the phase after ovulation, but before your period, where if you were going to get pregnant, that's when implantation would happen. That's when your progesterone's at its highest, your estrogen is at its second highest, and that's where we generally check those two hormones. The reason for that is because the phase before it, which is known as the follicular phase, your progesterone's very, very low. It's near zero. It's supposed to be. It's, it doesn't come out then. Progesterone is very, um, um, she's very, uh, only makes her grand appearance once you release the egg, once you ovulate. So just like your example when you said, hey, when did you get these blood labs drawn? And they're like, I don't know, after my appointment last Tuesday at two o'clock, right? Like, like it could be anything. So we, we do need to know, we need everybody to know that. Now here's where it gets tricky. If you're perimenopausal and if you have irregular cycles where you're like, well, I skipped last month and then this month I had two periods. I don't necessarily run estrogen and progesterone because I'm like, well, you're pretty wonky because your cycles are coming and going, but I do run all your other hormones. I want to know your cortisol, your testosterone, your DHEA, your thyroid, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I may even do advanced testing on you. And in my introduction, I used to work for a company called the Dutch test, which is a urine test. And the reason I like the urine test, which is basically you pee on a strip of paper a couple times a day. And, they, and then you let it dry, mail it to the lab, and they extract hormones out of it. But they also tell me what are called metabolites, which is where are your hormones going. So even if your estrogen is wonky or one month you don't have it, the next month you do, it still gives me an idea of where it's going. And the reason I want to know where your estrogen is going is because in our bodies, we want our estrogen to break down in a healthy manner. But unfortunately, it can also break down in an unhealthy manner, and it can lead to worse PMS or worse periods or, you know, polyps and fibroid growth, or worst, worst, worst case scenario could contribute to cancers like breast cancer. So knowing those, that information, even in a perimenopausal woman, I'm like, great, but I can help you with your diet or supplements to get your estrogen to go down the correct pathway so that when you do make it, when you, God forbid, have two periods in a month, which means your estrogen is going to be kind of all over the place, we can direct it in the place that it needs to go. So working with somebody who's perimenopausal may not be as simple as, well, I just went to my OBGYN or I just went to my primary care because that may not be their focus. While you would think an OBGYN should know everything there is to know about hormones, in my experience, and this is no shame at all to them, they predominantly focus on the reproductive age. They're obstetrics and gynecology, right? So they know hormones, but they also want to like deliver babies. That's their goal. So if you get into perimenopause, a lot of them understand it, but it's not their specialty. So you may need to add to your team, your, your healthcare team, of somebody who actually focuses in perimenopause and knows to say, well, what have your last couple of cycles been like? Where are you in your cycle right now? What's going on? You know, like, what age did your mom go through menopause or your sisters or your aunts or what have you? Like, what? And to really paint this picture to really sort of hone in on how should we work you up? What's the best testing? When was the last time you had any testing? And you know what can we do moving forward? Well, I definitely love the Dutch test. I run that <laughs> quite regularly mm -hmm. in my practice. Prior to really diving into functional medicine and even knowing what the Dutch test was, I did just blood testing, but it doesn't usually correlate with how someone is feeling. I will say, for myself, I had an endometrial ablation years ago, so I don't have periods. Right. So I just finished the cycle mapping for myself yes. this yes. past week, and I can't wait to see what my results are. <laughs> um, 
Can you speak a little bit about cycle mapping yeah. and why this would be a viable option? Who specifically this would be really good for? It's a great test. Have you ever said to yourself or your best friend or your sister, have you ever thought to yourself, you know what? I would just like to know my hormones every day. Right, we see we see the um, the blood glucose monitor that you know that you can put in your arm, and it's a little filament that reads, and can, you just scan your phone, and it'll go. Your blood sugar is ninety two. Wouldn't it be great if we could go? What is my estrogen doing today? Because I am moody, and I have a headache, and I'm tired, and I just like to know. So the cycle mapping is kind of it's not a thing in the arm. It is a urine one urine test that you take every day um, to give you an idea. Basically maps out what is your estrogen. We have the two main ones, estradiol or uh, excuse me, yeah, estradiol and estrone, and progesterone doing every day. And it's really nice when you say I feel very hormonal but I'm hormonal on these days. I get migraines right before ovulation and right at my period. Or, um, oh my gosh, the whole week before my period comes, I'm super depressed, I'm super bloated, um, and I've all, you know, my skin breaks out. Like, what is happening in those seven days with my hormones? Um, or uh, what, there was one recently, um, allergies. Uh, I, my allergies are terrible right at ovulation and and then like right after ovulation like what's going on there because it's it's the same time every month and i know what this is and i'm like oh my gosh this is very clearly hormonally connected how nice to have the whole month long view and so i can say oh look at this this is what your estrogen's doing oh look at this this is what your progesterone's doing so that's why i love the cycle mapping i do not use it for somebody who's menopausal even though you might feel hormonal menopausal, which is when you don't have a period anymore, because you don't have a period and your ovaries aren't working, your hormones are very flatlined. Your estrogens and progesterones are very flatlined. So don't waste your money. Don't do it then. And I don't tend to use it on women who have irregular cycles. So again, if you're the person who says, well, I skipped last month, but I had two periods the month before that. This month, it seems to be late. When you do a cycle mapping, I'm only going to get the results for the, that particular month. So we're recording this in the month of March. If you told me, Carrie, I had two periods this month, then I'm going to see what your hormones are this month. But then if I talk to you in April and you go, nope, skipped April, didn't have a period at all, the results won't apply because March and April were different. So I do tend to use it more on women who have a more predictable cycle. And we have figured out a lot of their symptoms can correlate around like ovulation and, you know, like after ovulation leading up to their period. I definitely love personalized medicine yeah. instead of, I know that I've had a lot of patients have some type of hormone testing they did on themselves. Mm -hmm. They have no idea how to read it. They said, I, I paid on these strips. It wasn't the Dutch test. <laughs> and they're like, what am I supposed to do with this? And again, I have to ask them, where were you in your cycle? Mm -hmm. Like somebody should be really helping patients to piece this together. Yeah. Yeah, I agree because, and I'm really grateful for the amount of medical autonomy we have out there that there are a lot of direct to consumer labs. If you were some, if you've asked your doctor for a vitamin D and your, your doctor goes, no, I don't believe in vitamin D. And you're like, you know what? I'm going to order it myself. I'm really glad we have that ability out there. But on the flip side, sometimes a little bit of knowledge is toxic. <laughs> and so people <laughs> will order these big expensive tests because they're so sick and they're so frustrated and I don't blame them. But then they're left with pages of information and go, well, crap, now what? Like I have the test, but I don't have anyone to read it. And so that's where I'm like, oh, this is, you know, like, educational resources like you and your podcast are what I just live for because I'm trying to get people like, I'm glad you got the test, but also, are you sure that's the test you should have started with? Are you sure, you know, like we've got to get somebody to read it for you. We've got to have somebody personalize it for you. Just because you saw on social media that this person needed a particular supplement doesn't mean that you do, but now you've spent money on it. Are you, like, are you sure that's what you need? And so I know it can be frustrating, but at the same time, like, trying to, you know, we're trying to help them, right? And save their budget. Exactly. So that's where it gets exactly. tricky. Sometimes I say, we don't even have to test hormones. We can work on, let's just get you sleeping. Yes. You know, <laughs> let, let's get your, let's get your stress management, you know, in line. Yeah. And this is coming from a woman 
that was such high stress. I had have like this tightness in my chest. I'd get up in the middle of the night and I would come out to my desk and I'd start reading journal articles and I would say, I'll sleep when I'm dead. Mm -hmm. Now I don't have a thyroid. <laughs> I'm like, well, I've got a lot of problems now. So <laughs> yeah, I'm going to make sure I hopefully will not add more problems to the list. Yeah. And so if they can't, if they don't want to spend the money on the testing, if we're trying to work through some things, there's definitely lots that we can do yeah or just even look at the adrenals and yeah. that's another thing i love about the dutch and the the dutch plus is the is the adrenal component because i have yet to see a normal air quotes again normal adrenal test <laughs> like results yeah i just did a consult for a friend of mine i'm just helping out i don't and i i said send me your send me your dutch test what's going on and her cortisol levels were extremely low. And I emailed her back and I said, girl, are you tired? Are you, you must be so tired. And I hear this all the time. She wrote me back and she said, you know, I thought I was tired, but I didn't realize how tired I was. I've been lying to myself. I've been living on caffeine or pretending that I wasn't tired or continuing to move just jumping from one thing on the task list to the next thing, because I was afraid if I slowed down, I would have to recognize how tired I was. And I thought you are not the only woman to tell me that. And there it is, I would say in black and white, but really in the Dutch test, it's blue and gray. It was blue and gray was how tired she really was. And I could go hang this on the fr your fridge to remind you, 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 like you, I mean, I understand why we do it. Sometimes, sometimes in our life, we just have to push through. We have to burn the candle at both ends. It's just what well, the phase that we're in. But if we recognize or sometimes see it in that, that blood work, or excuse me, that, that, well, in the blood work too, but in the, in that Dutch test, then it's almost like validation. Like, okay, I am worse than I'm thought I was, or I am pretending to be something I'm not. And then we don't want them to continue on a path of destruction internally yeah. in their body. Yeah. And if it helps with setting boundaries. Yeah. I, I've seen that a lot where somebody's saying, a woman's saying, oh, I don't have any problems with that. Are you sleeping? I sleep. Okay. Do you stay asleep? No. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, how, how long are you awake during the night? Like two hours, but you're sleeping. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> and when they see the results, it's eye opening. Mm -hmm. And then they finally have that, they feel empowered to actually put themselves first. Mm -hmm. I know for myself, I can't believe that I have my fake battery operated candles <laughs> <laughs> by my bed. I, I, I'm reading, I have this, my night routine is like sacred. Oh yeah, same. I'm my the most boring person yeah. in the world. I don't wanna go out at night. Yeah, <laughs> I don't wanna deviate. 21 year old self would be mortified and my 45 year old self is thrilled. My husband and I got into bed at 8.30 last night. We had a very long day. It was very involved. We got into bed at 8.30 and I went, this is the best ever. We're in I bed before that. nine. You know, like we were reading. I was like, oh, this is, like, who are we? <laughs> I, I love that because you know what? It, it makes a huge difference. Yeah. It's made a huge difference in my life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm working with lots of women mm -hmm. and I see them, you know, three months later, six months later, and they're like, completely different, different individuals. Yeah. They tell me that they, you know, they're, they communicate better with their spouse because they're talking about the way that they feel they've set boundaries. They're saying no, yeah. which you know what, sometimes we need to say no. <laughs> mm -hmm. No is a complete sentence. Yep. Yes. Um, you mentioned menopausal women would not be the right, uh, individual to do cycle mapping. Is there a way to test their hormones and what about if they're currently on hormone replacement therapy? Yep. Can they still have their hormones tested? Oh, absolutely, for sure. Yeah, and because they don't have a cycle, winter, um, so the true definition of menopause is you have not had a period for 12 consecutive months. Um, on the 13th period-free month, you are considered menopausal, assuming you're at the appropriate age. If you're listening to this and you happen to be 22 years old and you haven't had your period in 12 months, you're not menopausal, that's something probably different. But if yes. you're listening to this and you're 52 years old, you are menopausal by the time you hit that 13th month. Doesn't mean you're not symptom free, but it does mean you are period free. So because you are period free and your ovaries aren't cycling anymore, you can actually test your hormones at any time you want. 
So once you fully flip into menopause, you can test it at Tuesday on a two o'clock because it's roughly the same as it would be on Wednesday, on Thursday, on Friday, and Saturday. You're kind of just low flat all the time. That's it, the estrogens and progesterones. That's, that's what happens in menopause. So depending on budget, you could start with blood work. Um, which obviously, of course, can be covered by insurance. But because of the risk of in menopause, you know, the, uh, unfortunately, the risk of you know, like breast cancers um, or uterine cancers tends to hit when we're older. Uh, I love the Dutch test because again, I get to see those metabolites. Even though you're not making as many estrogens as you used to, they're still getting metabolized or detoxed a particular way. And I would still like to redirect them in a healthy manner so that you know we can reduce your risk of breast cancer as best we can as you get into the fifth, sixth, seventh decade, et cetera, of life. So I still really like the Dutch test and cortisol is still really important. I wanna see your cortisol pattern. Testosterone, DHA, still really important. Even in menopause, I wanna see that. Progesterone, progesterone absolutely gets written off. Like, oh, you're menopausal, you don't need progesterone anymore. Wrong, progesterone is so important for, it's our calming, soothing, relaxing, everything's going to be okay hormone. If you were listening to this and you were like, I am not calm, soothed, or relaxed, I don't feel like <laughs> anything's okay, you probably need progesterone. And it's okay generally to take it in, in the menopausal time frame. So that's why I do like the Dutch test. Plus you actually get other markers as well. Dutch adds in some vitamin markers, B12, um, B6, um, an antioxidant marker. It checks your melatonin. It checks glutathione, a glutathione marker. So you get some extra cool benefits. It even does a gut marker. Uh, the Dutch test is not a um, like a GI health test. It's, it's purely hormone. Um, but they do one marker that shows up in urine. So if you are having gas, bloating, constipation, diarrhea, you know, like some GI stuff going on, you're not loving right now, and that marker pops high or positive, then you may need to add an additional testing. Like what's going on in your stomach? What's going on in your intestines? Um, to give you those answers. So despite some people saying, well, in menopause, your hormone should be low, so why test? I'm like, no, no, no. But you can still, you're, you're, you're going to live this life for the next one third to one, you know, half um, of the rest of your life. Let's do it. Let's thrive as opposed to just feeling low and depleted all the time. And then if you are on HRT, hormone replacement therapy, you can absolutely test and, um, see where you're at, see if you're on the right amount and see how it's working for you. Do remember hormone replacement therapy is encompasses a lot of types of therapies. Hormone, there are over 50 hormones. So what hormone are you on, right? So thyroid hormone is considered a hormone. Progesterone, the estrogens, testosterone, DHEA, et cetera. There are a number of hormones out there. Regardless, you can test while you're on them. And once you're menopausal, I, I advise you stay on them. So sometimes people will say, well, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop my estrogens and progesterone because I want to see what my baseline is. I'm like, I know what your baseline is. It's low. You're menopausal. So we might as well stay on it and then make sure you're on the right dose. Yes. And like you said, I love being able to follow the pathways. Yeah. You're, again, a plug for your Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> Friends, you need to check it out. Your love bathtub it. analogy. I mm. don't do it justice. I try to think about the way that you describe it because it's 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 great and i feel like it it really makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. when i'm explaining to somebody that that drain is clogged mm -hmm. and they're like my drain is clogged i'm like your drain is clogged <laughs> <laughs> yes because we're you know we're thinking i need these hormones i need the hormones then they're telling me they don't feel better they're still having hot flashes and we i, I say we need let's slow down and let's Think about all of the different components here, because yeah. again, are you sleeping? What do you? What kinds of foods are you eating? Yeah, no vegetables. Yeah, oftentimes. Yeah, definitely not any cruciferous vegetables, and maybe a few supplements here and there, but they're not strategic. Right, right. I am definitely a fan of strategic supplements. I don't believe in magical supplements. And I definitely tell my patients, if the only thing they're willing to do are supplements, it's it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. Like you, we have to make at least some basic changes for our health mm -hmm. because otherwise the, the supplements are band-aids. Yeah. It's yeah. essentially like taking a prescription medication, except it's a supplement. Right. Right. What are your thoughts on supplements and vitamins I, with perimenopause and menopause? Yeah. 
I do you have any favorites? I, I'm a huge fan for sure. Um, and, um, but I agree with you and that they're often, often, not always, but oftentimes a band aid. And if you and I had a magical supplement and I would, I tell women this all the time, I wouldn't charge for it. I would just airdrop it across the United States. I put it in the water supply. If I had a magical supplement, like, especially for women's health, I would just be like, you know what, half the population, let's just give it to everybody for free. It would make the world a better place. Yes, so the whole world would benefit. The whole world would benefit. So, but sadly, I don't have a magical supplement. So, but yes, there are a number, you know, as we like, for, let's take medications for as a, an example. I was just talking to somebody about this the other day. Um, I was consulting with a colleague. They had a patient who was on the diabetes medication metformin for a long time. And lo and behold, they started having neurologic issues, um, numbness, tingling, um, uh, like balance issues. And everybody was like, it's got to be your diabetes. It has to be your diabetes because that's a big issue. The functional practitioner ran a vitamins. They were B12 deficient. One of the known side effects of the medication metformin, which is also known as glucophage, is to deplete vitamin B12. What does vitamin B12 do? Well, it's super helpful for your neurologic system. So that means you're going to maybe feel numbness, tingling, have some balance issues, brain fog, et cetera. And so by repleting their B12, their symptoms got better, went away completely. In fact, it wasn't their diabetes. It was the fact that they were missing B12. So even as something like understanding the medications you're on and they can often deplete these vitamins is, can be life-changing, you know, like imagine having numbness and tingling in your feet and not having really great balance because of B vitamins, not yeah. because you're, it's not, um, you know, something else, something, you know, a, a disease of some sort. And then when it comes to, um, just at vitamin D, you know, I live in Pacific Northwest, I am not kidding. It's the end of March. It is currently snowing. Um, I'm done. I'm done with this. <laughs> I need to move on. Yesterday it rained all day. So like our vitamin D is terrible, so, which means that, you know, a lot of people in the Northwest, oh, across the world in general, um, probably could use some form somehow, get their vitamin D improved some way. And then when it comes to perimenopause, there are great herbs um, for um, helping support our transition for our brain, for the symptoms we're having, hot flashes, night sweats, for stress. You know, we have herbs, um, it, we call them adaptogens that are good for resiliency and, and it, like supporting everything, the stress that we're going through. And so I do really like them, but I know that they're not also one size fits all. Uh, like an example, you will see oftentimes on social media, ashwagandha, the herb ashwagandha, um, which is perfectly safe if you have hypothyroidism. But if you have hyperthyroidism, if you're a Graves patient, which is too fast, too much thyroid, um, you shouldn't, you have to be very careful. You shouldn't take ashwagandha. Another really common one is called rhodiola. Rhodiola is in a lot of things. I love rhodiola. It's extremely stimulatory to spend, depending on the dose you're taking. So if you're taking rhodiola and you're like, I can't sleep and I feel anxious, I'm kind of jittery, but you haven't put two and two together. You're just like, I'm like tired, but wired. I'm, I'm sort of stressed. I don't understand what's wrong. It could be that rhodiola has really pressed that, that gas pedal for you. And rhodiola, according to herbalists, is quite drying. So great if you're having night sweats, but bad if you are already dry in menopause, right? Dry eyes, dry skin, dry vagina. Lots of rhodiola is probably just going to make you drier. And so I, this is where, again, going back to that personalized medicine can just be helpful in these little nuances of like, hey, I'm a big fan of herbs. If somebody says, do you like adaptogens, Carrie, for stress? I do. I love them. But I don't love all of them for all people. I love that. And, <laughs> you know, yes. I, I use a lot of adaptogens myself. Mm -hmm. And I I prefer to have them separated than like yes. an adrenal blend. Yes. And sometimes yeah. somebody will come to me and they have like three medications listed. And I'm like, do you take any supplements? No. You're not taking any vitamins. Well, I take some of the, this adrenal blend. I'm like, what? What's in there? They, they don't know. Right. And then when I'm like, what's the name of it? We look it up. There's like 15 different herbs in there, mm -hmm. and I prefer to do things. And I know they say herbs are typically not used individually, but I like to start them individually. Mm -hmm. See how somebody does on them. As an example, I did my adrenal testing last year and saw my my adrenals were messed up. Uh -huh. Big surprise. And so I tried different things. And then I tried passion flower. Yeah. And it was way too intense for me. 
it was too strong. So I cut that out. And it's, it's knowing, trying to really understand the way your body feels when you take something. And sometimes it means getting rid of yeah. a lot of supplements and starting at like the basics, like yeah. the first floor. <laughs> yeah. 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 I agree. Yeah. I'm also surprised, um, having worked at the Dutch test for a number of years, the number of people who were taking medications or supplements, excuse me, um, that had maybe even hormones in it and they didn't realize it. Like I would have yeah. people that would take pre-workout and the pre-workout had DHEA in it, but the DHEA was aimed at men. And these women were like, I'm having hair loss and I'm breaking out and I'm like angry all the time. I'm like, well, your pre-workout has 50 milligrams of DHEA in it. And yes. they didn't advertise it on the front of the bottle, but you had to read the back of the bottle to know that. Or I would have people say, oh my gosh, I'm really drowsy. I, I sleep, but when I wake up, I'm exhausted. And they're taking some sort of blend that had five milligrams of melatonin in it. Now, it didn't say it on the front, but in the back, when you read the ingredients, I'm like, well, no wonder. I mean, melatonin can help with sleep, but for some people, if they're on too much, it, they sure wake up drowsy, really yeah. drowsy. And it's a known side effect. An but another it's hard. important reason to read the labels. Yes, for sure. <laughs> of what you're eating, anything you're putting in or on your body. Yeah. You definitely need to know what's in there. There's some v vitamins like multivitamins that have thyroid hormones in there. Yeah. Like glandulars. Yeah. I see yeah. that a lot. Yeah. yeah. We shouldn't be messing with that because then I tell them it can actually make you hypothyroid then. Mm -hmm. So again, a, a, a need to have individualized care, personalized yeah. medicine and somebody helping because I find the brand, the dose, and the length of time play a vital role in how a supplement's going to be able to help anyway. Yeah, agreed. Going to your local drugstore and just picking up some generic herbal blend may or may not help. Right. And sometimes the herbs that they have in there, one is to calm cortisol and one is to rev you up. Mm -hmm. So oh my God. I don't think this is what you should be taking. Right. And knocking <laughs> each other out. Right. Dr. Jones, I have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. And I'm sure we could continue discussing these topics for hours. Is there anything we have not discussed that you want to be sure my listeners know? Any clinical pearls you feel are crucial for optimal hormonal health? Yes. In fact, I have it on the sign for those who are watching the video one behind me. It says healing happens at joy. And it's not my quote. And unfortunately, I've forgotten the woman who said the quote now. But um, I thought that was so helpful because as you said earlier, women often fear or dread the act of going into perimenopause and menopause. It is often a very stressful time in general for them because they're now in their 40th or 50th, you know, age range and stress is really compounded and they have forgotten how to find their joy or how to have joy. And so I just remind women, you know, laughter, community and joy are going to go a long way um, and are really important that you nurture that because while we agree supplements are very helpful, um, you know, those baseline basic things, finding joy, even if it's in the little funny memes that you send your best friend every day, if it's the funny things your children say, you know, it's funny things and whatever it is, find your joy because it can really make a big difference. And it pulls you out of that fight or flight and puts you into that rest, digest, heal, um, and get better mode. And that's the mode that we're ultimately trying to be in most of the time. Absolutely. That's the mode I'm trying to tap into <laughs> on a regular basis. Yes. And, um, and I, I, I tell my patients it's practice. Like we yeah. have to practice these things. And the four, seven, eight breathing is one of my favorites. Mm. And it can, it does change you when mm -hmm. you do that, but you have to do it. Mm -hmm. And these are things we can do that are free. Mm -hmm. And I, everybody can benefit from having some type of a de-stress routine, mm -hmm. something to do when you're in traffic and somebody cuts you off and you can feel your blood pressure rising and your heart's racing and you're gripping the steering wheel. Cause that was me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, ab absolutely. This has been such a wonderful conversation. How can my listeners learn more about you? Where can they find you? So they can find me on Instagram. <laughs> Last time we'll <laughs> plug it, I promise. So I'm at dr.carryjones. I have dipped my big toe into TikTok. 
uh, for better or for Ooh. worse, which is the same handle at Dr. Carrie Jones. And then my website is www, surprise, www.drcarriejones.com. If you are a practitioner listening and you are interested in lab ordering um, or labs we've talked about, uh, rupahealth.com. Unfortunately, it's not to consumers or patients yet, but um, we are, stay tuned. You never know what's going to happen. And I'm a big fan of Rupa Health. I do all of my ordering through there because yes. it's very easy. Mm -hmm. And definitely practitioners listening, you want to learn about this because it's it's uh, enlightening when you can actually see results that can make a true difference yeah. in the management plan for what, what we're doing. Yeah. Um, definitely, I will link everything you said in the show notes. And I'm going to have to check you out on TikTok because... I got to tell you, there's not much I like on TikTok. There's a bunch. There's there's a lot of misinformation out there. Crazy. I watch a lot of animal TikTok if I'm on TikTok or like house tricks. I've learned how to be an adult in weird things like how to clean my dishwasher. Didn't know how. How to, you know, like things with my dryer vent. I did not know, but I know now. <laughs> so I have learned tiny things from TikTok, which is pretty funny. Well, that is very funny. Dr. Jones, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And I want to have you on again someday because this, <laughs> this is, is fantastic. This is a lot of fun. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you.